Hello, I'm Andy, and I'd like to take a few minutes to explore what the Bible has to say about the resurrection. Let's first establish what the Bible's claim is, and as a result of that, what the purpose of the resurrection as a concept and its teaching is. Now, the nature of this topic means that to understand it, we will need to touch on several other Bible principles, so bear with me on that. Hopefully, then, if the topic of the resurrection is new to you, you may want to know more. If what we've got to say is different to your understanding, then we would be happy to discuss that too. Our main hope is that having looked at the topic, you're then motivated to find out more. And if that's the case, the best way to do that is with a Bible in hand. We'd also encourage a prayerful approach to finding out about God and about his son, Jesus. This short talk has been provided by the Christadelphian community in Mumbles, near Swansea, South Wales, UK. If you're listening elsewhere in the world, then you can find your local Christadelphian community by searching Christadelphian ALS in your internet browser. We'd love to hear from you. So without further ado, let's take a look at our topic. For most people growing up in a Western culture, as I have, the story of Easter is familiar from a young age. It's taught in schools and families pass down its message to a greater or lesser extent. As with most things, the commercialization of the topic can result in the original message being lost. Easter should be a reminder of the topic of the resurrection for many. Yet how often do people stop to think of the significance of the message to them personally? For Christadelphians, we don't keep Easter in a religious calendar sense. That's for a number of good reasons, and that's for a different discussion on another day. Certainly, children will listen to Easter stories where there's a chocolate egg reward involved. But the story of the crucifixion and of Jesus' resurrection holds captive many others, young and old, as it touches on a sensitive subject and a problem we all have to face up to at some stage, and that is death. The recent and ongoing pandemic has uncovered frailties in the modern life we live in terms of the inability to respond to a virus that spreads so quickly and it appears so discriminately across the globe. Why is science taking so long? Why have so many people died as a result? Why have politicians not intervened sooner? These and many more are the questions on many people's lips. It has certainly brought a black cloud to many with reports of depression and anxiety styled the shadow pandemic racing across society. Our confidence has been knocked, our construction works have slowed, but it's also caused people to stop to recognise openly and public, publicly praise those who care for society. These are truly momentous times. As Christadelphians, we hold the Bible in utmost regard and of utmost authority. As a result, we take attempts to discredit it as serious because people's well-being depend upon knowing the truth. This stance is different to many other faiths in the sense that other than translation errors, it's our belief that the Bible teaches that there is no other form of authority. It's our belief that the Holy Spirit was the means by which the writers of the Bible were first inspired. But it's not our belief that the Holy Spirit is required now for the interpretation of it. In that sense, the Bible then becomes open and free for all to read and to seek out the mind of God through its teachings. The Bible's claim is that of no private interpretation, quoting from the second of Peter 1 and verse 20. And that's important for it to be a credible book. What that means is this, as we approach it, we may at first not agree with it, or we might find an issue with it, but its pages remain open for further inquiry at the right time. So the claim of the Bible is that its purpose is to instruct people in the subject of righteousness. And on your screen, you should see a quotation from 2nd of Timothy 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given, and as you can see is highlighted, for instruction in righteousness. And this term righteousness is a very much a biblical term. Another Bible claim is that 
This is the holy inspired word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now some people struggle with that as a concept and as a result find it difficult to continue to read. The Bible's answer to this situation though is found in its pages. The writer and the quotation on your screen now to the Hebrews in the 11th chapter and verse 6 who was inspired by God said without faith it is impossible to please God he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a faithful rewarder of those that diligently seek him so what he's saying there is if you don't believe in God then it's not possible for you to understand the teaching of God Further, the, the Bible declares Jesus to be the word made flesh and that to understand the mind of God, we must approach God through Jesus. God has pri provided his son to show the path to follow to get to that understanding. And to obtain life, we must seek for the truth of the message of the Bible. Now, one of those truths is about the purpose of the resurrection. So on your screen now, you should have the quotation where Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not possible to understand God unless we get to understand Jesus. So with that in mind, then we turn to the scriptures for enlightenment and instruction on the subject of resurrection. So what is resurrection? Well, as a word, as you can see on the screen, its origins are from the Greek language, and it's very much a New Testament phrase. The word resurrection is found in 39 separate New Testament passages. The Greek word anastasis literally means to stand up or to be vertical. And that's in stark contrast to its opposite, which is to lie down or to be horizontal. And these two chaps in the screen here demonstrate that for us. The way the term is used is very descriptive of resurrection. For in man's natural state, um, at the point of death, we, are, we, we remain horizontal. And what the resurrection is about is the, the, the power that it enables man to stand up again a number of verses in the bible describe how god raised jesus up again because he had no sin in fact jesus refers to himself in john 10 and verse 18 as being given the power to raise himself back up again he's inferring that he had not sinned and we know that jesus received that power from god so in this little word there's a lot of meaning and sentiment when you think about it to stand up on a daily basis takes a lot of effort we see the struggles of a young child as they learn to crawl to stand and eventually walk and that's a very human thing but when age or disease strikes this privilege is removed at the point of death the bible explains that man goes to his long home and the mourners go about the streets Quoting from Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 5 on the screen there. Again, the Bible teaches that there is nothing beyond the grave. The grave or earth is man's inheritance in his natural state. From dust unto dust is the familiar term you might have heard of. In Psalms 115 and verse 17, the inspired writer reiterates this point which is supported by a number of other Bible quotations. He says, the dead do not praise the Lord, neither any that go down to silence. This Bible teaching may be different to what a number of Christian denominations or other faiths believe in relation to an immortal soul. Christadelphians have been scouring the Bible for the past 170 plus years and haven't found any evidence to support the teaching of an immortal soul. In fact, we have found that the Bible 
is to be as silent as the grave about that topic. But it's been very clear on teaching about what, when and why the resurrection is needed. The New Testament is alive with references to the resurrection as a means of assurance from God to man. Now, some people may choose to put their treasure in the hands of a bank or maybe a safety deposit box. The teaching of Jesus is that the most important asset that you or I have is your life. And that that should be placed in a form of security that has no equal. Of course, he's speaking about God. There is a parable in Luke 16, which clearly shows us the, this message and uses the concept of an investment to help us grasp what God is trying to tell us. In fact, Jesus discourages laying up material wealth in this life, as it is a distraction from the reality of the frailty and the fragility of life. In Matthew 6 and verse 19 and 20, he illustrates this point. To demonstrate God's intent, his good news, he showed through Jesus the level of confidence that can be placed in him, an assurance by allowing him to die, but raising him up again because he did no sin. Jesus in Matthew's gospel says, don't fear those that kill the body. Fear him that is able to destroy the body and the soul, referring to God as the ultimate authority. On your screen, you'll have the quotation from the Acts of the Apostles, and it shows that God has appointed a man and given that assurance to all by raising him from the dead. What more of an assurance could be provided? It truly was a miraculous event. It's something that is difficult to comprehend with the current limitations of science and everything we know. But the Bible is clear. The physical, psychosomatic, body and mind resurrection from the dead is what the Bible clearly talks about. And it pins that teaching to a certain day, a day of judgment, a day of reward for all mankind. The word righteousness appears again in this quotation. And that word literally means to live like God in a righteous way, to, to, to live after God's righteous means. And that's a tall order for all of us. And we often fall short. But God is pleased with those that try to live life with moral virtues based on his teaching. This way of life recognises him as the origin of good. In essence, we are saying that God is right. So you can see how the teaching of the resurrection is linked to other subjects and topics such as judgment, sin, eternal life and the future purpose of the earth. Quoting from the screen, the times of the ignorance where people didn't know about God and his ways with mankind, God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he gave his only begotten son. He raised him up or allowed him to be raised up on a pole so that everybody would know what is to be done with sin. That is to be overcome. Verse 31, because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man that he's appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. And we appreciate that if the concept of the resurrection is new to you, it can be difficult to accommodate the first time round. But don't give in. This next Bible passage from Acts and chapter 10 this time introduces some further good news. God raised Jesus from the dead. God had selected people to be a witness of his resurrection, to validate the account. Oftentimes the Bible can come under scrutiny and people might say, how do you know it's true? But when you read the Bible and read into it the provision that God has made, so that the Bible can stand alone on its own two feet. 
then it becomes apparent that the account of Jesus' resurrection is true. It says that the disciples spent time with Jesus doing normal things, eating and drinking. Jesus, who they, they had seen, openly dismantled, destroyed physically at the hands of cruel men, was now healthy and well. He was bearing the scars of his trial, but he sat in front of them very much alive. As a result of this fascinating turnaround, he said, go and talk to others about it. Go and tell others the, the good news. What wasn't there to talk about? Can you imagine? The message was this, that Jesus was the person that the Old Testament had been speaking about. He, he was the one that God had appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Now, this introduces another interesting topic about the state in which people are raised and who or what the criteria is for those raised. The Bible clearly teaches that the resurrection of the dead is according to knowledge that not everyone in history will be raised to judgment. Judgment is on the basis of accountability. Jesus, when speaking to the lawyers of his day, who rejected his authority, told them that they would be raised to judgment and would see others entering into the kingdom of God. And they themselves disallowed because of their lack of unbelief, their lack of faith. Again, lots to talk about on that topic, but let's forge ahead. Verse 40 from the screen there. God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen in a specific way so that we, inheritors of the, 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 the gospel and the, the message some many years later, would be able to have confidence in the record. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses who God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he is the one who God has appointed as a judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In one of Paul's letters, the letter to the Corinthians, he shares with the members at Corinth the revelation that he had directly from Jesus. For the purposes of Paul's ministry, it was necessary for Jesus to fill in the gaps, the bits that Paul didn't know about, because at the time he hated Jesus, he hated the disciples and was seeking to persecute them. And that's because Paul was a young, prominent lawyer of his day. And he had yet to have his mind and his eyes opened and his prejudice removed concerning the law as he, as he, as he understood it then. Paul was an independent mind, an excellent scholar, a vehement opponent of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel. For Paul to be convinced, it took a miracle. But through his conversion, it provided one of the most uncompromised witnesses of the truth of Jesus. And this provides us again with confidence of the claims of the Bible. Paul wasn't a person converted for personal gain. He was a professional of his day that had everything to lose and everything to live for and nothing to gain from conversion other than his own eternal well-being. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, as you can see on the screen here, clarifies the teaching of the resurrection in an end-to-end -end way. And the whole chapter is well worthy of reading in your own time. In these opening verses, he repeats that the resurrection and the events associated with it were what God had been trying to tell everyone through the nation of Israel for the previous 2000 years. He then goes on to state his independent witness position and he speaks of the 514 people that had seen Jesus physically risen. 500 people in any city is a statistically robust amount. In fact, using some sampling techniques, it's possible to say that 514 people in a city of half a million, let's say, that's probably over, uh, an overestimate of how many people were in Jerusalem at the time, would provide a robust estimate of the general feel of the city at that time. The sentiment 
there was no doubting the evidence of the events pertaining to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. A little snapshot there in terms of finding the confidence interval and determining sample size. As you can see, a sample of 462 people in a population of half a million at a confidence level of 5.6, it gives, it gives us a 99% confidence level. Quoting from verse 3, I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. It's a wonderful account and it's credible in many ways. You might be wondering what the purpose of this lamb is. And on the previous screen, that was when yesterday morning I walked out in the backyard and, and there was a, a lamb and he was separated from his flock. Um, he was on this mound of earth, busily inquiring into it. And it wasn't until I came behind him and took a picture and then called him that he turned around, looked and, and then sheepishly, you might say, wandered off to try and find the rest of the flock and he was bleating for a while until one of them came and found him. Now, in those previous New Testament quotes, Paul repeatedly used the, used the phrase, according to the scriptures. And what he means by that is the Old Testament. Now we've said that the resurrection is a New Testament phrase, um, uh, the word anastasis, but the Old Testament itself spoke about the need for resurrection right from the outset. And I've chosen here one well-known portion to share with you. What this portion does is it implicates both you and I in the death of Jesus, and as such is a power, powerful piece of scripture to make us stop and think. There are a series of parallels between Jesus and between us. Hopefully this makes us recognise the enormity of our life without guidance, or we might call under sin, and without the direction that God's word provides. And as a result, we stop to ask why and what should I do? It says of Jesus that he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces, that's speaking about us figuratively, from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one of us to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a, a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is done, so he opened not his mouth. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12 to 19 then, Paul goes on to illustrate and outline to us this end-to-end -end process of what the resurrection entails. To start with, he, he, he takes the challenge of the day and he introduces this seven-stage process to explain the resurrection. There's a term, uh, a concept called a negative burden of proof principle. And here, Paul uses that to illustrate the things of fact. An example, just so we can, can relate to it, might be that your child, your grandchild argues that with their sibling that there isn't anything in the cereal bowl when there clearly is. And eventually, through the process of deduction and reasoning, the argument exhausts itself. And so knowing that Jesus had risen from the dead, Paul explores the implications of this new claim that Jesus wasn't actually risen from the dead. And that's a claim that people might even use today. It had been about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, this rumour began to circulate. So in verse 12 on the screen there, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, liars. 
because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. He's clearly stating the necessity for Jesus' resurrection and also for our own resurrection, physically and mentally. So having established that negative uh, reasoning and, and argument, he then goes on to present the fact in verse 20, the fact as he understood it that day. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's saying Christ was raised from the dead and likewise those who have died in Christ, in faith, believing in God, will also be risen. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And therein is the explanation of the work of Jesus. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ all shall be made alive. And so the challenge for us is to understand how we become in Christ. In verse 23, then he goes to give an order, a time scale, a structure, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruit, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet, speaking of Jesus. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is that challenge that faces us all, death. He quotes from the Old Testament in verse 27 and concludes in verse 28. Now when all these are made subject to him, then the son of himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. The culmination of all this results in a kingdom of God on earth. This is then followed by a final state that integrates all earthly activities into heavenly activities where the ultimate authority is God. Now that for us might seem a million miles away from our day-to-day -day experience, even beyond comprehension. We might understandably struggle with this as a concept. The concept that all will be in all, and God will have dominion over the earth, which today, beyond the high street facade and the veil of tears, is a world riddled with sickness and strife, where the needy go without, where the creation itself has been groaning under the heavy travail of man's activities for years, where economic interests are placed ahead of environmental and societal interests. We've had a unique opportunity, a reprieve and a brief glimpse during this pandemic of how quickly nature recovers. Crystal clear waters in the canals of Venice, a much improved air quality, reduction in harmful emissions in China, in Los Angeles, in Beirut, Lebanon, are all illustrated on the screen. Yet the call by industry to get the economy thriving means the environment will return to its prior condition at an alarming rate. That's because there is no plausible alternative option. My main fear, and I'm sure it's shared by many others, is that the global memory will be short-lived. Once demand starts back again, all of these images will become a distant memory. But for those who look for God's kingdom to be set up on earth, it's a glimpse at a pristine earth. It's also an insight into how polluted in every way the earth is by man walking in his own paths and according to his own knowledge. The purpose of Jesus' resurrection was to provide us with confidence, assurance that God will intervene in human affairs. It was to demonstrate that the way to victory over sin had been opened up for all who come to God through faith in him. That the very issue that we all have to face, the fragility of life and the reality of death, will be addressed once and for all. If that's the case, what steps does God require? Reading from the screen here. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. The picture that's painted by the apostle 
is of a very different earth, a very different existence. He says, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And who would have thought that nature could have recovered so quickly? And it feels like a, a twinkling of an eye, doesn't it? It feels like a distant world at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality just like Jesus was resurrected so all flesh will be changed so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory Paul in Romans 6 provides the answer then as to how we might benefit and we might be involved. He makes it clear that Jesus has achieved all in overcoming sin. We discuss the dilemma for the world to resume normal activity and the impacts of the environment. Likewise for us, leaving behind a life of sin, heading off into the unknown can be equally as challenging and the appeal of self-interest can resurface at any time. It's often easy to go back to what we know. But Jesus has demonstrated to us the path of righteousness, the, re the rewards as a result of that faithfulness. He makes it clear that even though we sin through Jesus, we are released from the strength of sin by God's grace. The way we associate with Jesus is through the waters of baptism. And on your screen here, there's a, a picture of the River Jordan where Jesus himself was baptised. And we live a life compatible with the life that Jesus led. That's pleasing to God. We live a life changed, seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And we put aside former desires and motives, reckoning ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And that's Paul's argument in Romans chapter 6, the text that's on the screen. Shall we continue in sin, he says, that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live it any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptised into Christ Jesus, were baptised into his death? And so baptism is painted as a figure of death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so baptism is presented to us as the means of association with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, physically, mentally. And so let's recap on what we've discussed. Thank you firstly for your time, and I hope this was of use. What is the resurrection? Well, the resurrection is evidence and proof that the Bible is God's inspired word. That God will cause the faithful to stand up in the last day, even though they might sleep before Jesus' return. The resurrection is God's assurance to you and to me that his promises will be fulfilled. That the offer of assurance is open to all. In fact, God commands that all obey his call because there will be no flesh and blood in existence only a transformed creation. Jesus will judge the earth at his second coming. We, like sheep, are prone to go astray, but can seek forgiveness. That the way to receive these blessings is through the development of faith and ultimately baptism into the saving name of Jesus. If you want to discuss this topic further, then by all means, send an email on the address listed below. But in the meantime, stay safe and thank you for your time.